Okay, hi, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for this week's DVU teaching, which is on restrictive cardiomyopathy. And we will also be talking um, about diastolic dysfunction because I guess you really can't talk about restrictive cardiomyopathy without talking about diastolic dysfunction. And um, uh, we'll touch on constricted pericarditis as well. These are all kind of favorite exam topics. Okay, so. Screen. Okay, so a little bit, um, so we'll do a little bit about the theory and then we'll go into, um, we'll, do, we'll just do one case and it's probably like a typical exam case and we'll um, briefly go over some diastology and you can ask questions. Okay. So um, restrictive cardiomyopathy. So restrictive cardiomyopathy is distinct from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and dilated cardiomyopathy. There is some overlap in the physiological principles and what you might find on the echo, but like in terms of the pathology, they're different entities. They're classified differently. So um, restrictive cardiomyopathy is a, a pretty heterogeneous group of disorders. Um, it includes idiopathic, res idiopathic restrictive cardiomyopathy, cardiac amyloidosis, big favorite for exams. I'll get to why later on. Uh, sarcoidosis, hyperiosinophilic cardiomyopathy, which is really interesting actually. But you'll probably never see those things. What you might see, or well, the most common one, is amyloid, uh, cardiac amyloidosis. So, I used to think that if it was called restrictive cardiomyopathy, it was, you know, automatically a grade three diastolic dysfunction with like the really high E wave and the low A wave and the EA of two, but that's not actually the case. You can just start, basically it just describes like a thick, stiff ventricle and you can start with some mild diastolic dysfunction and as the disease progresses, then you get the severity of diastolic dysfunction worsening. Um, okay, so the most common one is uh, cardiac amyloidosis, and it's characterized by hypertrophy, which is usually concentric hypertrophy. It'll include the right ventricle as well, the atria thick, the, the valve leaflets are thick, everything's just thickened. Um, and uh, as a consequence of that, the LV cavity is small. Um, classically described as a speckled myocardium, with um, a large left atrium, which you'll um, find with your diastolic dysfunction anyway. Um, and it has a very, very typical strain pattern. So it's a, the cherry on top strain pattern. I'll show you an example later. Um, and, but it's basi basically that strain pattern is basically pathognomonic for cardiac amyloidosis. And examiners love it. It's just so nice to see when you when you do a strain and then you come up with the target and you get this little red um, bit in the middle, which is the apical sparing of um, the contractile dysfunction. So the rest of the heart's struggling, but the apex for some reason is spared and the contraction there is preserved. And sometimes you might get a pericardial effusion. Um, so I'll just quickly go through, through some of the other causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy, even though you probably won't see them. Uh, so one is sarcoid, and classically you have these focal um, thinning or aneurysms. There's regional wall motion abnormalities, which will not be explained by um, the coronary artery ischemia, and it's quite patchy. Um, diastolic dysfunction as well, and they have this very, very echogenic um, myocardium. So these are just the echo features and then you would really just only suspect it in somebody that probably already has a diagnosis of sarcoid. Um, Febreze disease, very rare. Um, uh, storage disease of the myocytes um, gives you a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as well. You get um, aortic regurge and mitral regurge and aortic root dilatation. And again, really probably I suspected somebody with a diagnosis of Fabry's disease and then they kind of come in with for, for echo. Um, and hyperiosinophilic. So this is 
pretty interesting. So it's this, um, you have high eosinophils it's, it, and the, it causes this kind of eosinophilic um, inflammation or infiltration um, that actually seems to preference the apices for some reason. The, the left and right apex become obliterated by this ingrowth of, um, of this hyperosinophilic myocardium. Uh, and um, and you, you, you should really differentiate from a thrombosis, for example, because it can look like an apical thrombosis. Um, and they do get um, clots everywhere because everything's like highly inflammatory and it can present with strokes and embolic phenomenon. Um, and uh, the valve thrombosis, it can be like sub subvalvular and then trap the leaflets um, causing um, regurge, particularly mitral and tricuspid. Okay, so can anyone describe, um, has anyone, has anyone seen um, restrictive cardiomyopathy before? Yep. Yep. And how did you diagnose it? How did you go through the echo? Uh, so the patients I've seen it in, I think, were known already to have cardiac amyloid. Um, I do remember one patient who actually the diagnosis had been unclear when the patient presented. And they'd gotten as far as actually being taken to surgery for a pericardectomy for what was thought to be constrictive pericarditis. It didn't help, of course. And it turned out that the patient probably had a restricted cardiomyopathy. So they'd presented with, you know, like heart failure type symptoms, I guess. Um, and I guess on the basis of, you know, elevated filling pressures and a pericardium that was thought to look a bit funny, um, they'd received um, probably in retrospect a wrong diagnosis. That's, yeah, that's a great story, which brings me to my next point, which is it's typically confused with constricted pericarditis. So, I mean, it is, it is, I guess superficially it looks the same, but um, there's actually a pretty easy way to tell them apart. So with constrictive pericarditis, you get a high medial E prime. So with a restricted cardiomyopathy, your E prime will be depressed, um, both medial and lateral. And typically in everyone, whether you have diastolic dysfunction or not, your medial E primes always, always, always lower than your lateral E prime. So on your, so for, for those of you who are fairly new to, to echo, when we're talking about E prime, what we're talking about is on your four, apical four chamber view, you go to the tissue Doppler mode and you put a pulse wave at the mitral annulus. You do two of those, one at the medial, you get your waveform, and then you do one at the lateral, you get your waveform. And what you're looking for is an E and A wave, just the same way you have an E and A wave on your mitral inflow or an E and A wave um, on your uh, like M mode through the mitral tips. It's the same thing. So you would look at the E, the peak E velocity, and that's your E prime. That's what's called an E prime. Sometimes it's an uppercase E um, apostrophe, sometimes lowercase e apostrophe. Um, so anyway, so that's always lower medially than laterally. And if you think about it, it makes sense because the medial mitral annulus has the right ventricle kind of dragging it down. So it's always going to be lower than the lateral one. And then as your diastolic dysfunction progresses, that ratio stays the same. So your medial E prime in grade one, two, three, mild, moderate, severe diastology is still lower than your lateral. With constrictive pericarditis, you get something called annulus reverses. So that ratio reverses. So your medial E prime is suddenly higher than your lateral E prime. And I think that's a pretty good sign. I don't, to my knowledge, there's nothing else that does it. Um, so if you see that, and presuming you've measured it correctly and you've got a proper sample and a proper waveform and a good window, then 
you should basically you should be able to say this is constrictive pericarditis or not. Um, and the reason for that is because with the constrict constrictive pericarditis, the inflammation in the pericardium actually kind of tethers the myocardium. Um, so that lateral myocardium on that lateral uh, mitral annulus doesn't can't move there's too much friction if you like um, and it doesn't it, it kind of yeah it gets tethered so then that value will go down it's not moving very well and your medial one will be actually actually goes up to compensate um, so the heart's trying to keep the same same output going so it will contract wherever it can contract um, a couple of other things that you'll see in constricted pericarditis is the diastolic septal bounce. I mean, I, I actually see that a lot, um, so I, I don't think it's very specific. Um, uh, and then you see interventricular dependence and essentially the same hemodynamic profile that you would use for um, a tamponade, for example. So um, can anyone tell me what what kind of hemodynamic parameters you look for when you're trying to diagnose um, a cardiac tamponade? Anyone? For your um, mitral inflows with your respiratory variation, I think it's you get more than 25% and it's higher for tricuspid inflows, so it's more than 40% variation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, the, the different cutoffs are quoted in different places. So some, sometimes it's 25, sometimes it's 30, sometimes it's 40. Um, but the, what you want to look for is um, as, you, as, you, as the patient um, takes a breath in with inspiration, your right sided inflow should increase because you've got more venous return. So, so your tricuspid inflow velocities, when you put your pulse wave at tricuspid inflow, that should go up with inspiration and down with expiration. And then the opposite happens with the mitral inflow. And what that, all that is, is actually just interventricular dependence. Um, and the clinical sign would be pulses paradoxes. Um, and with um, constrictive pericarditis, you also get hepatic vein diastolic flow reversal. And that's very specific for constrictive pericarditis. I, uh, if, if you can see it, it's really good. I think you have to have a good, um, a good idea of the timing of when your inspiration and expiration is. And I'll just show you this so this was um this is a talk that i attended by dr j ho o who wrote the textbook on diastology essentially i referenced him last time i did a diastology talk so basically what you can see here is um so this is restrictive cardiomyopathy and this is constrictive pericarditis so with the constrictive pericarditis here you're getting your diastolic flow reversal with expiration and then he that doesn't happen with restrictive cardiomyopathy okay benny can i just check because i'm just getting my head around this part of this concept yeah so normal hepatic vein waveforms are basically the same as the pulmonary vein waveforms, right? You've got an S wave and a D wave that would both go in the same direction and then an atrial reversal that goes the other way. Exactly, exactly. Right. So, so the abnormality here is that the D wave is reversed rather than going towards the atria as yeah. the S wave does. Yeah. Well, it gets, it gets small, it can just get smaller. And then, yeah, it gets smaller and then it reverses. Okay. And then... The, or, you, the, or you get a... I should, okay. Well, it's, probably, it's not the D wave. It's, it's an exaggeration of the atrial reversal wave. 
Okay. All right. So, yeah. So. <laughs> okay. So on these, you've got think? an S and then a D, yes. and then that's the actual reversal going back. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you get, um, so, so, sorry. So the, Te te so the technical way to describe it is end diastolic flow reversal, and what they mean is, so you have you have the that that dias that forward flow in diastole, but it's very small. It's less forward flow, and then you get a higher atrial reversal wave. So here you've got the S mm -hmm. and the D, mm -hmm. and this is your atrial reversal wave, yeah. and then it's S D. S, D, S, D, the D gets small and the atrial reversal wave gets, gets bigger. Got it. Okay. And then there's a difference. Is there a difference whether it's more an inspiration or more an expiration? So it's supposed to be an expiration. Okay. So this is supposed to be expiration and then you get this atrial reversal wave. Okay. Okay. Thank you and for that. Uh, it is. It does. It looks. It should look exactly the same as um, your pulmonary vein Doppler, except it's upside down. Yeah. Um. And what I might, I can actually. I've got it up here. I've got, got a nice picture in the. Um, do I have it here? So, so this is the guidelines and I think um, no um, I think it was on the posters no Okay, just give me. Really? Yeah. I yes. Know. Variations we are talking of are spontaneously breathing patients, isn't it? <laughs> yes, that's true. This is spontaneously breathing patients. This is not people on a ventilator. On a vent, like there, there's nothing that validates any of this stuff on a ventilator. So there's nothing I can say with absolute certainty about what it would look like. That said, I think in practice, what we do is we inverse what we expect. So what you would normally expect on inspiration, you would look for on expiration on somebody on the ventilator because of the positive pressure. That's not like legal, if you, if you, if you know what I mean. Um, so there, um, I have, there's a nice picture in one of the posters. I'll just get that one sec. Okay. So on so here, so again, this is the this is the um ASC poster on pericardial disease. And here it describes what you should be looking for again. Um, so pulse wave Doppler of mitral inflow. So it's a constrictive pericarditis. Uh, pulse wave Doppler of mitral inflow velocity. So here. And tricuspid inflow velocities here. And hepatic vein here. So this is the diastolic reversal that they are talking about here. Um, and they also do it, here's an SVC as well. Um, just, yeah. Um, okay, so does that make sense so far? Yeah, that's great, thanks. And um, so some other things that you can look at um, are looking at a thick pericardium, which to be honest, you probably, I don't know if I, I don't think I'd be able to pick that on an echo, but if they've had previous CT imaging, they can, uh, it was very thick, they can certainly see that with calcification. Um, uh, respirophasic changes in the IVS, which is essentially what we've already described. And 
the history would also tweak you because these days most of the constricted pericarditis you see is post-surgical. Um, yeah, and then and I think both restrictive cardiomyopathy and constricted pericarditis, as you pointed out, Danielle, would present with heart failure symptoms. Okay, so um, do you want to see a case or do, should we talk about diastolic dysfunction? Maybe we'll do it. Okay. Maybe we'll do a case. We'll do a yeah, case. I'd be happy with the case. Um, okay, so the more technical difficulties, the images really didn't like being transferred onto a Mac, so hopefully this all works. Okay. So, Ben, you want to tell me about what you see here? I'm happy to give it a shot. It's, uh, it's not, I apologize, it's not a great, it's not uh, looping seamlessly like it would on yeah, yeah. your echo packs. Um, so, what do you yeah. think? I'll show you a couple more. So tell me about this one. Yeah, so like it is a bit acknowledging it's a bit jumpy. Um, so I guess the standout features um, on this uh, view is that the posterior um, pericardium appears quite white, making me think it's thickened. Um, that's what jumps out the most just from glancing at it now. Um, the uh, do you think it's just posterior? No, but I think uh, that's the bit that jumps out the most. Sure. I think it's going to be, I think it's everywhere. Um, certainly, uh, the, the septum appears thick, and the, the left ventricular free wall certainly appears hypertrophied as well. Um, I can't comment much on. The valve just due to what I can see, like yeah, it, sure. it's jumping too much. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, so those are your measurements. Uh, so what do you think about? So, so one is what measuring the is just the septal width, is that right? Yeah, so there's a uh, so one is the intraventricular septum, the next measurement is your LV cavity, and the next measurement is your blue wall. Okay. Um so I don't know the reference, like I don't know the, the normal ranges. Um the it, I'm assuming that the uh septum and the LV uh, posterior wall are above the um upper limit of normal, um, but I'm not sure. No, so they're quite hypertrophied. So um, the upper limit of, not, limit of normal for, for, for women is nine millimeters, and right, okay. for men it's 10 millimeters. Okay, yeah. So anything above that is hypertrophy, and yeah. then there's mild, moderate, and severe. Mild would be up to 12, I think. Yeah. Up to 13, 14. And then, no, I think moderate is 13, 14, 15. 16 and then severe is over 16. Yeah, I think severe is over 16. Yeah, right, that's moderate. For men. Yeah. <laughs> Falling in moderate. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so this is at least moderate, bordering on severe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hypertrophy. And, and, and can you give me another descriptor of the hypertrophy? Uh, I, mean, I could use a, a lot of descriptors, but they might be the ones you're looking for. Um, so. I mean, I was going to say it's almost symmetrical or uniform hypertrophy as opposed to... Yeah, so, so when it's symmetrical, we call it concentric. Yeah, okay. Concentric hypertrophy, yeah. yeah. Cool, good. So uh, and that's because there are, I mean, when you're talking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, there are uh, subtypes. There are phenotypes of a genotype, and there, yeah. there are also, there's like a apical one, there's a asymmetric asymmetrical septal hypertrophy um, and they have different com uh, complications and implications. Yep. Okay. All right. Um. 
Okay, so sorry, I have to open this again. <coughs> um, okay, Emma, do you want to tell me what view do we have here? This is um, my ventricular inflow view. Excellent. Um, based on pillar Doppler, it's difficult to, you shouldn't grade the severity of TR, of course, using Doppler, uh, pillar Doppler alone, but it looks at least moderate, if not verging on severe. There is a, conver a flow convergence zone, which makes me think it's, it's, it's more heading towards severe, because um, you wouldn't expect a flow convergence um, if it was only moderate, based on pillar. Sure. Okay, good. This is a, and what would you do next? Uh, I put continuous wave through it good. and um, look for a V cutoff sign and see what the, if the peak velocity was less than two meters per second. That would be more consistent with severe TR. We could maybe measure a PISA radius, a vena contractor. Um, yep. Excellent. And quantify it. So this is your, this is actually a different view with a better Doppler alignment. What do you think of the TR there? Um, so there's two things we can comment on uh, qualitatively, which is the, the density of the jet, which is of course going to be affected by the gain settings, etc. But it looks sort of between faint and dense. Like it, I think it's more than sort of just faint. So I'd be thinking from that perspective, it looks more like a moderate TR. And then we can look at the shape, the, con the contour of the jet. Um, and it looks to be more parabolic. So based on this and the colour, I'd say it's probably moderate TR, but again, I'd want to interrogate it in more views, make sure it's correctly aligned um, and be doing more quantitative analysis of the jet. Good. Do you, do you think the, the, the velocity there um, has any bearing on the severity of the TR? No, it doesn't. The, the, the velocity of the TR is not correlated to tricuspid regurg volume or severity. Perfect. Just what I want to do. Okay. Uh, okay, so Lee, um, what view do we have here? Um. Are we looking at the uh, parasternal short axis at the pulmonary vein? Uh, sorry, pulmonary artery. Yeah, excellent. So it's your RV outflow view. Mm -hmm. And what do you, what's, is there any abnormality here? Um, I mean, it looks like there's a, a, a fair whack of pulmonary regurgitation. Yeah, good. Probably like mild PR. Yeah, good. And what would you do next? Uh, I try to look at a pressure half time. Yep. Of the yep. pulmonary rego. Uh, so that's I think that's continuous wave, uh, and then you need to measure from the peak of your regurg flow down to the uh, essentially the end uh, along the top of the. There you go. Uh, so this is your continuous wave through that, trying to align it with that. PR as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Uh, uh, so uh, using the QRS complexes as reference, probably the one uh, after the first QRS complex. Yep, this one. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'd be tempted to up the gain a little bit just to see if there was a point that it was easier to differentiate uh, a consistent line. Yep. Um, and then you measure then, the pressure half time, right? So you go yeah. like that, like along the slope of the. Um, yeah, stopping where you see, where you can see the little uh, reflection of the pulmonary um, vein opening again. And the and the flatter it is, the or uh, the steeper it you, is. Is it mild uh, or severe? I thought if it was really steep, that meant there was pre rapid pressure equalization. So it, it could be, it suggests it's worse. Yes, exactly. So if it, the, the, the 
curve drops off really rapidly, equalization of pressures, that means it's more severe. Excellent, okay. Good, so, uh, sorry, I have to quit this each time, otherwise it will, um, it will not, uh, it will play everything in a sequence. Okay, so what do you think? Uh, so Lee, last uh, question on that um, pulmonary artery Doppler. What do you think of this? So this is a pulse wave at the RVOT. Um, to be candid, I'm not sure what I'm looking for. Uh, we can see the, the valve opening in, and closing. Yeah. Uh, as far as the reflections are concerned, but I'm not sure if we're supposed to be doing a, a, a VTI or... Um... So, um, so the, I think the, the most value of doing this is just to look at the waveform. So um, if you have this, this little, if I can convince you that there's a W, I think there's better images later on, there's a W sign, they call that the flying W sign, that's a sign of severe pulmonary hypertension potentially. And you could do a pulmonary va uh, valve acceleration time. And that um, if it's less than 90, then you have uh, pulmonary, significant pulmonary hypertension. If it's greater than 120 milliseconds, it's a uh, normal. That said, it really depends on getting a good sample. So, and, and a good trace. And I think this is, this one's probably a bit too fuzzy. But those are the things that you would be looking for at this point. Um, Thanks. Okay. Um, who's next? Jason, do you want to tell me what you see here? So this looks like a short axis uh, parasternal view of the LV cutting through the mitral valve. Yep. Um, What do you think of the function, the, the function of the, the LV there? Uh, not really sure based on this. Like it's very hard to look at it. Um, gro it doesn't look grossly abnormal, but there does seem to be a little bit of um, so that's an apex, is there? abnormal movement or dyskinesis. At least it doesn't seem to be all contracting the same. Okay. Do you think it, so? Do you think there is systolic impairment or not? The apex looks uh, better than it does at the uh, mitral valve level, at least uh, between the two. So, based on that, I would say that the, at least at the uh, uh, the mid mid LV, it probably is down then. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So let's skip to the money now that I've interrogated everybody. Um, and but it's by no means over. We'll come back. We'll come back to get the rest. Okay. I'm just going to go through. Okay. So we did strain and then we saw this. So Jason, what do you think is going on? Uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm not very familiar with strain stuff yet. Okay, so, so, so just for everyone's information, the systolic function by the Simpsons by plan method um, was 28%, the ejection fraction. So we've got a concentric hypertrophy and moderate bordering on severe. We've got a severe systolic dysfunction. We'll go through the diastology later. Um, and you've got this on your strain. So you've got this apical sparing of your myocardial contraction. So what, what, <laughs> what pathological process that I've just talked about um, would this be potentially? Amyloid. Yeah, good. So this is cardiac amyloidosis. Well, I think it's Brian. cardiac amyloidosis. Um, this is somebody's echo I reported on Friday. So um, 
yeah, so we'll see. So he's actually 86 and it, the echo was for something completely unrelated. It was for a stroke worker. And I didn't see any thrombus or anything, but um, but we did incidentally note this. So uh, we've suggested a cardiology follow-up, but to be honest, I mean, he's 86 and he's just had a stroke. So I don't know that they can do much about it at this point. Maybe he'll be listed for transplant then. What's that? Maybe he'll be listed for transplant. I'm, I'm yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, a sensible thing to do in some places. Um, yeah, good. Okay, so the, again, so this again is the cherry on top, the apical sparing um, when you have a myocardial dysfunction, very classic of a cardiac amyloid. Examiners love this. So whether you're sitting the DDU or the, or the um, ASC exam, um, this is a, this is a, everyone really likes it because you can just look at the picture and you immediately have your spot diagnosis. Provided that obviously the caveat with all of these things is always that your technique's good, that you've, um, when you plot out the stream that is tracked, the, the speckle tracking is tracking appropriately. Um, I apologize that I don't actually, can't actually show you how to do the strain um, today because I don't have, couldn't figure out how to, we've just moved around computers and I couldn't figure out how to do that um, all in the same room. <laughs> um, okay, so that's basically the money shot. We can go through a little bit of um, diastology if you like. Okay, so I gave a talk late, late last year on um, diastolic dysfunction. Um, that's available, or like all the talks, that's available on the uh, ISET website under DDU exam. Um, and I, that's a good hour of just diastology. So I recommend going through, the, watching that video and going through that. And also Prof McLean did a diastology talk earlier this year, which um, it was very different to mine. So I had to basically go through the guidelines and how to go through the algorithms. But he kind of looks at evidence and, um, uh, yeah, so that was a probably more clinical talk than mine. Um, okay, so with, I mean, oh, Danielle, you were at my last talk. Why don't you tell us about <laughs> diastolic dysfunction? Uh -huh. <laughs> Where do you want me to start? So where, where, do you, where do you start with diastolic dysfunction? What do you need to, what's the first thing that you look at? So um, probably, uh, so you can start by considering the patient's systolic function because yeah. the algorithm's different, right? You've yeah. got your algorithm, this is the one for patients with normal ejection yeah. fraction. And a patient who's got systolic dysfunction, you can almost assume that they will have some degree of diastolic dysfunction, um, which is likely to be grade one impaired relaxation or greater. And so, yes, yeah, so you start with the first algorithm if they've got normal ejection fraction, um, or and then the second algorithm is for if they do have diastolic dysfunction or they've got um, systolic dysfunction. Yeah, exactly. So. Perfect. So as it says on top, normal left ventricular ejection fraction, you should start here. Um, if, if it goes down to the right of this pathway, then you then move to the second algorithm. Or if they have systolic dysfunction, you go straight to the second flow chart. Or if they have um, hypertrophy, uh, and there are a couple of other conditions where you're supposed to go straight to this one, like ischemic heart disease, diabetes. But to be honest, in practice, um, I don't, I don't do that actually. If they, they've got systolic. In, in in practice, you end up measuring all of the diastolic parameters anyway for yeah. all patients. So yeah. you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, I, I guess part of the other, the other prop, the other problem with this or the reason why I don't go straight to this necessarily is because there's no option for not for for no diastolic dysfunction mm -hmm. so if you go to this algorithm you're immediately committing the patient to at least mild diastolic dysfunction that's the lowest grade you can have on this uh, flow flow chart 
Um, but otherwise, it looks scary, but really there's only four things that you're ever looking at, even with this one. So there's only, thing, there's only four categories of things that you need to do. So you just do your mitral inflow. So you do a pulse wave at the mitral tips in your apical four chamber, and that'll give you um, your E and A wave. And you just mark the velocities and that's it. And the machine will also give you a ratio, which you'll need for the second algorithm because you start with the ratios and your E velocities. Then you switch to tissue Doppler and you do a pulse wave at the medial or natural annulus like I described before. And you identify the E wave on those and you get a velocity, right? And that's, that's tissue, that's myocardial wall. So you'll notice that the velocities are really low. So they're in like centimeters per second. Whereas your E wave is in the tens of centimeters per second. And your, um, your like regurg jets and things are in meters per second because it's blood flow. Um, and then I look at the left atrium and I think we discussed previously, you need to index it to body surface area for these guidelines, but there are options if you don't have it, if you don't have the body surface area, which often we might not have that, or we can't get the views to get the volume because you need like similar to a Simpsons, you need two um, orthogonal good views. Um, but there is the option to leave it out. So if you've got three, only three of the four criteria, Oh, sorry, if you've only got two of the three criteria, and then you can go this down here. So two negative or two positive, etc. cetera. So, um, and what, in practice, what I do is, because that LA volume index of greater than 34 mils per meter squared is actually uh, corresponds to moderate or more dilated. So if it looks moderate to severely dilated or more, so if it's kind of, getting up, if it looks very prominent on the four chamber and uh, almost looks like if it's getting up towards the same size as the left ventricle, that's definitely dilated. So I would include that, even though I don't have a number to put, it, put on it. And then the only other thing is the TR. So continuous wave um, in whatever view you get the best alignment for a TR velocity and the greater than 2.8, and what you're actually measuring there is pulmonary hypertension. So you want to see that they have pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and then you move down the algorithm. So, um, so that's technically how to do it. Uh, and then conceptually, um, uh, th uh, think of diastolic dysfunction as actually impaired LV relaxation. So the it, some people think it's just LV like uh, filling pressures, it's not really. The first thing that happens is that the LV is very slow to relax and it's quite stiff. So in the grade one or mild diastolic dysfunction, you actually don't have raised filling pressures. And by definition, you have a normal left atrial pressure. Then as the um, diastolic dysfunction progresses, that backward pressure gives you a raised left atrial pressure that can't, um, the left atrium can't deal with the, the extra load. You get high filling pressures. And then, um, uh, yeah, and then in a grade three, then you get like, um, uh, it, go, it get, goes even more really. So from grade two and onwards, you have high left atrial pressures or high filling pressures. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so um, I've presented this before, but basically what I'm trying to point out is how in your intraventricular relaxation time, that, that gets slower because it's impaired. So this gets drawn out, that this curve kind of moves, um, gets stretched out towards the right. And this, so, um, Again, it's more sort of conceptually how to look at it. So here you have your mitral Doppler velocities, your E and your A wave. And with, um, this is normal on the left, and then you have a grade one 
two and three. So grade one is mild, where you just have impaired relaxation, normal left atrial pressures. Grade two is, or moderate is pseudo normalization, and grade three is a restrictive pattern. So um, in the in a normal person, you you have your um, uh, EA ratio, which is uh, uh, your E is higher than your A is close to one, but um, and then the E, sorry, the E goes down with impaired relaxation and then it goes up. And with that, you get um, your intraventricular relaxation time. First, it lengthens, then it goes down. Deceleration time as well lengthens and then it goes down. And with your pulmonary vein uh, velocities, um, I actually don't find them that, that helpful because your D wave on your pulmonary vein mirrors what your E wave does. So it's, you can basically just guess what your pulmonary vein waveform is going to look like. So um, again, the, the D wave, which is this one, goes down and then goes up. The atrial reversal wave, which is this one, might be useful because you can use the, if you have a good trace, you can measure the time. So you take the duration of your atrial reversal wave and you subtract the duration of your A wave up here. And if that's longer than 30 seconds, that's specific for diastolic dysfunction as well. It doesn't tell you what grade, it just tells you that it exists. And uh, with the tissue Doppler imaging, so this is why a lot of the Diet, like the, a lot of the um, diagnosis of diastolic dysfunction hinges on having a tissue Doppler because uh, uh, this one is the only one that just goes down. So it's also how you can differentiate this pseudo normal pattern from normal. You will have a low E prime. So um, in diastolic dysfunction, that will always go down. And not only does it go down, it goes down linearly. It also goes down with age because it's normal to get a stiff ventricle as you um, get older. Um, a couple of caveats with that is that it's not as reliable when you have something messing with the annulus. So if you have uh, my, severe mitral annular calcification or if you've had a mitral valve replacement or if you have conduction problems so your septal velocities won't be um, reflective of the diastolic dysfunction. Benny, um, what, if you, yeah. what if you've got regional wall motion abnormality affecting the lateral or the septal segment? Yeah, same. Same. Yeah, yeah same. Because it's not, because it's again, so, it's one point that we're trying to use to uh, reflect the entire left ventricle. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, um, a couple of other clues that are, I think, pretty easy to pick um, if you just want to figure out if this person has diastolic dysfunction because it's relevant clinically, but you can't grade it for whatever reason. Um, one of my favorites is the L wave. So this is your mitral inflow. This is a pulse wave at the mitral tips on an apical uh, view. Um, this actually looks like a five chamber. It should be a four chamber. Um, so this is your E wave and your A wave. Sorry, the ECG is cut off. And this extra um, wave here is called an L wave. And that's quite specific for diastolic dysfunction. And it actually tells you you have to have at least a grade two diastolic dysfunction because in order for this L wave to exist, you have to have um, high atrial pressures. So that means it's at least a grade two, at least a moderate, um, because the L wave is created when at the end of um, the E wave, when you're uh, pressure in your left atrium and left ventricle is equal. It's supposed to be equal. It's not. You've got such high left atrial pressures that you've got ongoing forward flow and that creates another wave. Okay. 
Is this making sense so far? Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, just jump in and ask any questions. Um, okay, we're almost time, so I'll just go, quickly go through a couple more bits. Okay, here's another example of an L wave, and it's only significant if it goes above 40 centimetres per second, so 0.4 metres per second. So, yeah. You can get it in bradycardia. You can get small L waves in bradycardia without diastolic dysfunction. Um, and can't remember why I put that in. Um, and then you have your, this is not a very good example of this. Benita Anderson's book has a really nice example of a B bump at the, um, I can't remember where I saw it. Um, so the B bump is on your M mode through the mitral tips on your parasternal view. So right here, in the parasternal view, you do an M mode through the mitral tips and then you get this extra wave. So you're only supposed to have an E and an A wave and then you get an extra wave at the end of your A wave. You can have actually even more than one bump um, and that's quite specific for diastolic dysfunction as well. Uh, that's another example of an L wave. A little bit more fused, but still there. And okay, so um, AF. So the problem with AF is if if on your if their ejection fraction is um, abnormal or if it's preserved, and then you go down your first pathway and you decide they've got diastolic dysfunction and you want to grade it. Um, if what you'll immediately notice, if I go back to the algorithm, is that you. Where you go down depends on your E and your A ratio, your EA ratio, right? So if you don't have an A because you're an AF, then you don't know where to go. So, um, great, like diastolic dysfunction in AF is a real problem. It's quite difficult to do. So some things that you can use to help you are things like an L wave. You might still see an L wave or a B bump. Um, but, sorry, not a B bump, an L wave. So one thing that you might notice, sorry, um, is um, so normally in AF, every beat will be quite variable. Just like in your VTI, that's why you have to average it over like over five VTIs, your LVO2 VTI, over five beats instead of the usual three, because you get quite a bit of variability. But when your left atrial pressure is high because you've got at least moderate diastolic dysfunction, that um, uh, becomes quite uniform. So one of the things you could look at, it's by no means um, like pathognomonic or anything like that, but uh, something that can help you decide that whether this patient, whether to go looking for more signs, is that the E-wave becomes quite uniform. So the velocities on your E-wave become fairly consistent. And I think that's, I think that's probably all, the, all that we have time for today. Um, so there was kind of a crash course in <laughs> diastology. Um, I was hoping to go back to the case and do an example, but we just don't have time. Um, if, if you want more teaching on diastology, we can do another one. Uh, or alternatively, you can look at the previous lectures that we've done. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, yes. I have questions. Uh, uh, you mentioned about uh, atrial fibrillation and difficulty with uh, assessing the diastolic yeah. function. How about uh, you know people having mitral valve disease or mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis? Yes. Yeah. Uh, diastolic dysfunction. Yeah, so that's, um, you know, I asked Prof the exact same question. <laughs> and the problem is that um, when they have that, the left atrial distension and pulmonary hypertension and they happen to have a moderate or more, so not insignificant mitral regurg um, or mitral stenosis, you, you, you don't know which pathology is causing what. Unfortunately, you don't know. 
Um, and potentially, yes, uh, you may overdiagnose the diastolic dysfunction, um, but it's the best we've got. And the guidelines, um, the algorithm isn't really f like it hasn't been tested in critically ill patients anyway. It's, it's these are sort of like cardiology outpatients, and they've done you know invasive measuring at the same time as doing echoes and come up with these cutoffs and standardizations, but this is all we have. Uh, this is there, the there, are, um, there are some parameters that are meant to be valid in mitral valve disease. It's just that they're not the ones in the algorithm. So yeah. I think your AR minus A duration is okay. I yeah. think your isovolumetric relaxation time is okay. And yeah. if they don't have a prosthetic mitral valve, like if they've just got MR, then I think you can still use your ET prime ratio, right? Um. Yeah, you can use all of those things. I'm just saying that you don't, you, like, technically I don't know if the left atrium is big because of the MR or is yeah. it big because of the diastolic So the left atrial di size is a problem and the TR jet velocity is a problem as well. Yeah. And those two parameters are often a problem in intensive care patients, particularly yeah. ones who are ventilated for whatever reason. Yeah. But, yeah, absolutely. I, I think the probably the most reliable is your E-prime. Um, uh, you can use that. Um, again, like the caveat, if you have a, a mitral valve replacement, it might not be accurate. Mm. Um, it'll be artificially lower um, and a mitral annular calcification, the same thing. So yeah, there are some problems, there are many problems <laughs> with it, but um, uh, yeah, that's, that's probably the best we've got. And um, in AF, um, in the guidelines, there are actually a set of criteria just for AF. So if you have a good trace on your TDI and um, pulmonary vein Doppler, you can use the, the AR, sorry, not the AR, you don't have any with. You can use the intraventricular relaxation time and the deceleration time. They have specific cutoffs for AF. Um, and you can use, um, you use the lower E prime cutoff as well. You use eleven instead of fourteen. So there are certain things that you can you can look for specific to AF. Um, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Did that answer your question? Sorry. It's, it's difficult to interpret, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay, cool. All right, we might just leave it there. Thanks everybody for joining. I hope that was helpful. Um, yeah, any Thank feedback you. is welcome as well. Thanks, Benny. That was great. Thank you. Bye. Bye.